should be eating real food. And we're all eating packaged foods. And when you drive down the road, the vast majority of the waste you see on the road and all of those plastic water bottles, you know, and it's not just water, there's soda bottles. Um, all of that is, is, you know, the same thing. And we are destroying the environment um, and our bodies with our food. I mean, never in the history of the world have people consumed food that they don't know what it is. You read an ingredient label, and how many times do you find something on there that you really don't know what it is, and you still eat it? <laughs> Seriously. And, and I mean, you know, it's, it's, I've done it. It's just, we're busy, we're running around, some of those nutrition bars, things like that. There's a lot of stuff that, that, keep, you know, that gets tied in together. So, you know, if that's one of the areas you know, bring in your food, guys. I am the food bringer. I have my bowls, I have my bag, I bring my food with me. Mostly because I don't want to eat other people's food where I don't know what it is. Um, and I'd like to have a little more control over it. So, all right. Starting with, one, I always put this slide in my presentations. You are what you eat. Um, I have a friend who says that she is what she eats. She's a big cheesy noodle. And she has the disease profile. Um, she's a high school friend, so we're both 48 now. And she has the disease profile that goes with a big cheesy noodle. We are turning over our red blood cells every 30-something days. We slough off the inside of our intestines every three days. So we are constantly replacing things in our body with nutrition. So why would you not be really careful about what you're putting into our bodies? And unfortunately, in our overly busy lives, it usually gets down prioritized. Um, and we end up eating lots of different things. So I want to give you my disclaimer on this topic. Genetics is mind-blowingly confusing, expansive. We've got 30 minutes. <laughs> so I'm giving you the Reader's Digest condensed version of this. But basal nutritional genomics, or nutrigenomics, is the study of how foods affect our genes um, and how individual genetic differences can affect the way we respond to nutrients. So the nutrients affecting us, um, the environment affecting us, um, and the genes hold the information that allows our body to keep going. Um, every time you need to make a new cell, your gene is doing that, and it holds that information, so it's incredibly important. Um, so I wanted to give you, this is DNA right here, and that is a gene. So I wanted to put in context, again, without going into an in-depth explanation of a gene in relationship to DNA, because you all see that double helix, we've been seeing that for years but that genes are made up of DNA and RNA, and that's kind of the information on how things are made and how your body continues to go on and how you start. The reason I put this up is this is a breakdown of DNA. I wanted to show you all of these little components that go into making your DNA up, that turns around and makes your genes up. That's where all things can be different. So when you look at it, there's six billion bases in our chromosomes. Um, that's how many things can be different. It's why we're so unique. Um, but there's some commonality within that. But it really goes to show you. Um, a lot of times what you see, any of you guys do the 23andMe? Any do the 23andMe testing? That was that $99 you could do some genetic testing, and they actually got shut down for a while, um, but really because, a lot of it because they were making some claims that the science isn't supporting as of yet. And so, um, but what they do is they look at SNPs. So these are little, in, in DNA strands, these are little occurrences that can go wrong and can cause you a lot of different things. It's possibly the basis of some of our disease. It's also possibly the basis of our uniqueness as well. Um, and so, you know, again, this kind of, I want to really stress, and, and Lita did a good job, this is new science, guys. We really don't know a lot of what we 
should be doing with this. Um, and that's part of the reason that the 23andMe kind of got closed was because they were probably making more claims and generalizations than they could. But, for instance, there are 250 genes that we know that are associated with obesity. Incredibly complex. We're still learning what that means and what that does. And within those genes, when you go back and you look at all the DNA and you look at all those little individual protein components, it can be one of those proteins in someone is going to do a completely different thing to the gene and it could be a different um, little protein that's in somebody else. So this is incredibly uh, complex. You guys probably are aware of the BRAC genes that are associated with breast cancer. Angelina Jolie ended up having a double mastectomy um, as, a re as a result of finding out she was positive for those genes. I'm positive for those genes. I have faith that I have more control and with my environment and with my choices in my lifestyle that I have far more control over this than a lot of people feel and I hope you guys walk from this talk with the idea that your genes are your genes but we have power. We have power in how they express and how they change and what the result is both in a good and a bad way because we're affecting our genes in both good and po positive and negative ways. Folic acid metabolism is a big one. This one, there's um, a lot of, lot of research there. It's probably one of the first ones that's come out. But one thing to hit home with this one is people metabolize nutrients differently. And so there's methylated forms of folic acid. Some people, because of their genetic predisposition, need those. And sometimes things like that can hurt people. So it's also a cautionary that, again, we're all so unique. So when you start to see generic recommendations, be, be careful of that because it, it's not that simple. Um, detoxification. You guys have the possibility of doing the detoxification. We're finding that there's a lot of genetic SNPs in there as well, that some people don't detoxify as well as others. I haven't had my genes tested for this, but I've assumed I'm a bad detoxifier. I don't drink well. Um, I'm very sensitive to caffeine, and I have horrible reactions to anesthesia. <laughs> so there's little kind of insights to a lot of this as well. Without actually knowing your genes, you can kind of really pay attention to yourself and, and know what's true for you. And then estrogen clearance. Um, this is probably one of the big factors in terms of breast cancer and some of the uh, more hormonal cancers like colon and prostate as well that people, you metabolize your estrogen and there's three pathways that your body leaves. One of them is very risky in terms of breast cancer development and all of that and this is also an area that we're finding genetic SNPs in. So somebody who doesn't clear estrogen well we're not going to want to be giving them soy products and things like that. And this is also one of the more common um, gene testing that you can get these days. This, super confusing, just wanted to give you an idea because one of the things I want to talk about is ancestry. Our genes are incredibly tied to our ancestors. And also want to say that it takes about 70 generations to change a gene. So what we're seeing now isn't so much that our genes are changing. What we're seeing now is our genes are reacting incredibly poorly to the environment that we have created with our food, with our environmental toxins. Our genes are struggling in the current environment. So what this is showing you is this is kind of age. So the lowest, the light blue, is back to the ice age. That's the last ice age. Um, what all the letters respond to are groups of people <coughs> that have certain genetics that are similar. And so what they found is that basically all genes, all people have, there's about a 99.9% .9 genotype. When you start to break off with these individual groups, you see these individuals in these letters groups that have about 80%. The numbers vary but about the 80% of the same genes. So that's why you start to see things in ethnic groups. 
um, because our genes are very similar. So with that said, again, where our ancestors come from, the evolutionary history, um, all of that is going to determine the genes that we have. And, you know, we're always talking about family history, but guys, this goes way, 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 way back. Um, and different gene variants contribute differently to health and disease susceptibility. Um, there is no perfect genotype. I know people have tried, they thought they could do that. Um, but <laughs> what's interesting is you see specific things. So for instance, um, diabetes, type 2 diabetes. In um, Hispanic individuals and in Asian individuals, the gene that tends to be the issue in these groups is insulin resistance. So they're insulin, they become insulin resistant. Um, that's very affected by activity, that's very affected by eating a lot of carbohydrates and our, and our current diets. Um, and then you see African American individuals and their gene susceptibility is more towards the, how the pancreas is working, something called beta cell, which is the, those are the cells that actually make insulin in our body. So you'd actually treat those individuals differently. But as in most disease and in Western medicine, we treat all disease pretty much the same. Our diet recommendations are very generic. Our medications that we prescribe are very generic. And so the possibility that we're starting to get through this gene um, information is that we need to probably be much more personalized. Um, and, and so that is going to become very important. Um, we know under certain circumstances and in some in individuals, diet can be a serious risk factor. That's why you see people sometimes, you see people eating junk food and you're like, how can they be not sick? How can they be okay? How do their labs look okay? All of that. It's because that genetic variant. And it's different for different people. For instance, my background is Irish. Um, when you look at my genotype, I am about 70% Irish English of that descendant. For that group of people, vascular issues are huge. Um, so risk for heart disease, risk for stroke, um, certain other vascular situations are common with that particular group of people. So all of us, we all have a different thing. Um, it's just really looking at that. Um, and again, the degree to which the diet influences really has to do with our genes and um, where we're at and how we live our life. So. <laughs> Genes are your genes. You can't change them. There's nothing you can do. They're in there. They're, they're yours. Embrace them. Love them. <laughs> they're, they're, you've got them. But what you have control over, and not everything, but a large portion of it, is your environment. So we're going to take a look at food, activity, um, stress, which is huge, 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 um, environmental exposure. But I want you to keep in mind that the body wants to heal itself. It really does. We get in its way, we, we challenge it on a daily basis, but your body really does want to heal itself. Um, so nutrition, where does that come in? Again, it underlies every body process. Every cell you are making is made up from the nutrients in your food. Um, it provides resources for healing. Phytochemicals in food, all those little chemicals that you get in colorful vegetables, most of which we don't even know exist. We know of a lot of them. You hear about resveratrol. You hear about the flavonoids and things like that. My, my feeling is we know a drop in the bucket of all these wonderful chemicals that are in our foods that actually help provide resources for healing. Um, provides poisons that delay our healing. When you're eating too much sugar, when you're um, drinking too much alcohol, when you're eating a lot of processed foods that don't have a lot of nutrients in them, that is somewhat poisoning your body. Um, and providing toxicants that injure the body system. Those two kind of go hand in hand. Take home for today is nutrition is more important than genetic structure because you are going to affect your genes expressing themselves 
with your nutrition and you can't control your genes. So this kind of explains, you ever talk to people doing fabulous on paleo. They've lost weight, they're meeting all their nutrition goals. Then you've got the vegan person. Personally, I've tried to be vegetarian. I've dabbled in veganism. I don't do well with it. Um, Low-fat cardiac diets. We've been prescribing these for years. Um, I have an issue with it, but um, you know, they do work on some people. A lot of people, they do not. Um, all of the reason that these work on some individuals and don't work on others is your genes. Those are unique to you. Um, you know, the government constantly providing information to us. They're telling us how to eat. Mostly I don't agree with that, to be quite honest. Our generic recommendations do not take into account the individual genetic and cultural, you know, aspects. In addition, um, you know, a lot of our recommendations are backed by big food companies, guys. I mean, I hate to say that, but that's the way it is. I personally, I'm, I'm part of, I'm a registered dietitian. I belong to an organization um, that has big food companies sponsor their conferences. So I don't, uh, you know, sometimes I, I don't like to tell people I'm a registered dietitian in Santa Cruz because we don't have a great reputation and it's why I switched to functional <coughs> medicine after working as a hospital dietitian for 18 years because of this aspect of things. Um, so this is my little equation. Um, good minus bad um, plus R equals P. So the good is the, things, the good things you can do for your body. I'm going to go over all of these. The B is the bad things that you can do and put in your body. R is the reserve that your body has left. The R is really your genetics. It's why some people can go longer without getting disease, why some people don't get so affected. That's really kind of the R. And P is the problems, pain, disease, all the things that happen when your bad outweighs your good and your reserves are tapped out. So the bad, inactivity. Y'all are great with that. I, I love, I saw that, those hanging classes. That was so cool. I was on Facebook going, I want to do that. Um, personally, I play hockey which is why my bottle looks the way it does. Um, and I do outdoor fitness classes, and um, I walk my dog on the beach every day, but inactivity is the death of us. <laughs> that and stress are, are so, so difficult. Um, eating the standard American diet, guys, that processed foods, even when you think they're nutritious, um, you know, there's so much misinformation with food these days. Um, you know, most the standard American is diet is high sugar, a lot of refined carbohydrates, processed fats, and virtually no vegetables. All of which is the perfect storm for your genes to just go in the worst way they possibly can. Then there's toxins, you know, pinging off what Lauren said. Um, you know, there are 100,000 chemicals that have been unleashed on us since 1940. Um, it drives me nuts when I hear people talk about organic farming being hippie, yuppie, Santa Cruzy, blah, blah, blah. It's how we farm forever. We've only been farming with the chemicals since 1940. So that is the way we really need to be. I saw a statistic that the average woman, by the time she walks out her door, is exposed to 300 different chemicals, from the cosmetics, <laughs> the household cleaners, everything that's in people's homes. All of this is making it so much more important that we eat well. Um, it's really putting our backs up against the wall. Smoking, um, excessive alcohol intake, and stress are just killers. That bad all the bad, and it drains our body of its resources. So what can we do for the good? Healthy fats, your omega-3 fatty acids, olive oil, avocado, coconut, um, <laughs> nuts, um, lean high quality proteins, they should be organic. We have changed our food system, guys. We have changed our food system by feeding animals corn, by feeding fish corn. 
we actually put the more inflammatory fats into our food um, if you're not eating organic. So you really want, with your, your proteins and your dairies, you want them organic because they're going to have more omega-3 fatty acids, which are your anti-inflammatory fats. Um, fresh fruits and vegetables. You really should be having about five to seven servings of non-starchy vegetables a day. Virtually nobody does that. Um, but if you really want to get all those phytochemicals and all the nutrients, that's what you're looking at. Um, berries are an excellent source of those. Anything bright colored. When you see bright colors, that lets you know you've got a lot of different nutrients in there. Purples, greens, yellows, oranges. Um, the cruciferous vegetables. Any of you guys know cruciferous? Cabbage. Cabbage. Broccoli, Broccoli cauliflower, Brussels sprouts, Brussels sprouts <laughs> kale. <laughs> you guys, these are your, oh, they're so awesome. They detoxify you. So for those of you who are doing the detoxification, you can do that all the time by eating these foods. Um, and so that's a really great thing. Um, and again, organic whenever possible. I try to do that as much as I possibly can, which at home is everything. Um, good continued exercise or activity. Um, again, if you can enjoy it, I think you get even more benefits. And that's what I love about what you guys are doing. Um, it's, so, it's so great. And even if you're not at the weight you want to be, fit people are more healthy than skinny, non-fit people. So keep that in mind, guys. It's not a weight thing. It's a fit thing. And so that's really what you're striving for. Um, and maintaining a healthy weight, which again, don't use the BMI. It doesn't, uh, athletes look obese on the BMI. And quite frankly, I'm horrified that we're now classifying disease based on it because it's such a horrible number. It's body composition, guys, and it's having the muscle the muscle burns calories, and so that's what you're trying to do, is maintain that muscle mass, which may make you look heavy. And it's also not these rail-thin models that are basically freak shows. That's kind of what our standard is of healthy, and that's not healthy, actually. Um, the exact macronutrient combination really depends on your genetics. The, what the standard recommendations of the government, my pyramid, all of that, is about 50 to 60 percent carbs, um, less than 30 percent from fat, and then about 10 percent protein. I personally eat somewhere between 35 to 45 percent carbs. <coughs> I'm always over 40 percent fat, and I'm around 20 percent protein. That works for my genotype. That's what works for me. Um, and so, and this is some of the information I have out on the table talks about a genetic program that you can actually find out what works for you in terms of exercise, in terms of your nutrient composition, this, because this doesn't work for everybody. That works for me, 48-year-old woman, to keep me out of menopause and keep my weight really controlled. Um, I was a heavy child, and it's why I got into nutrition, and I fought my weight almost half my life. And so it's, it, and it's tough. It's really tough for people because it's so complicated. Um, and then again, as far as supplements are concerned, food has nutrients we don't even know about. So I wrote a, I wrote a class for a, a school program. It was on functional foods and nutraceuticals. And every single study, I don't care what the nutrient was, every single study, food beat supplements. Every time, every single time. However, with that said, I feel like if you're not eating at least seven to nine servings of vegetables and fruit a day, you are probably not maximizing your nutrition. And you're probably not getting the nutrients you need to combat what we're exposed to on a daily basis. So with that said, supplements come into play, but not all supplements are equal. You want food-based supplements, you want quality. Things you do not want to cheap out on people, olive oil, tea, balsamic vinegar, and your supplements. If you really want the medicinal properties that all of these different things have, you need to probably get a higher quality. 
Um, and the supplements are a big one. Um, they are a notoriously, you know, they're, they're one of those industries where the, there's the bad and good. They're just like the pharmaceutical companies. They want to sell you stuff. They don't really care if you're pretty or skinny or anything like that. They're, they're marketing people, so you can really get sucked into a lot of things. So with that said, you definitely want to, to you know, talk to a professional about that. Um, and then, lastly, Hippocrates. You know, he was the first person to document a food allergy. It was milk. And, and he said, let food be thy medicine and medicine be thy food. I truly believe that, guys. I actually really believe that we can really control our health through our food. Um, and we're getting more and more information about it. The genetics are something that can help us. <coughs> but also really getting in tune with yourself, guys, and knowing what works for you. I haven't run these genetic tests to come up with those percentages for myself, but I've paid a lot of attention and I've really looked at a lot of different things. And so with that said, that's available, but also is really, really listening to your body because I feel like we all have this um, innate intuitive ability to heal ourselves and to, to really take care of ourselves. But there's so much garbage that is gets in the way of doing that that we get lost. Yeah? Uh, real quick, if you said it, I missed it. What exactly is a serving? When you say serving, what is a serving size of vegetables? So vegetables, um, you're looking at basically a cup of raw or a half a cup of cooked. So that's a serving of vegetables. So you want, like when I do a salad, I probably do three cups of greens. Um, and keep in mind, varying them also changes up the nutrition. So some of the microgreens, you know, different types of lettuce, all of that. Um, you know, cooked versus raw. There's, you know, there's the whole big raw food movement these days. And I think there's a lot of legitimacy to it. I don't, there's not a lot of science with it right now, but some of the thought behind eating things not so cooked is that there's enzymes in the food that we know about that actually help you break down and digest your food. So overcooking food, not the best. Personally, I like the edge taken off my cruciferous vegetables. <laughs> I'm not a raw cruciferous vegetable gal. <laughs> I just want the little bit, yeah. Are there certain vegetables that actually become more nutrition, nutritious after they're cooked, like tomatoes? The tomatoes. Yeah, and in fact, uh, that's a good point. Um, but not all of them. Most of them lose. Like vitamin C is very, very heat um, susceptible. And you leach a lot of the, the B vitamins out of your food with cooking in water. But in, in terms of tomato, the heating process, and especially if you combine it with fat, actually enhances the absorption of the lycopenes, which are the phytonutrients in a tomato. So... Yeah. Wow, you guys are, you're like, time to go. <laughs> tick, tick. <laughs> what is your take on um, how everybody has their individual genes? And my mom is really concerned for me and my sister because my grandma had osteoporosis and now she has the onset and she's only like 53. And so she's really concerned for me and my sister I mean, is that preventable for us, per se, or is there kind of some pattern? There's patterns. Yeah. I mean, my grandmother and my mother have early onset Alzheimer's, and when I did my genetic testing, I also have those genes. So, but I'm taking herbs. I am, I live a much healthier life than both my mom and my grandmother did. And so with that said, yeah, that's probably going to affect me, but I'm going to hold that one off as long as I possibly can. So really getting some good quality, um, <coughs> you know, calcium, um, not, doing weight-bearing exercise is huge, and um, not overdoing it on the protein. Because some of the thought behind why we need so much calcium is because we have really high protein diets. So that would be something you'd is want to think bubbly, about. I've heard that bubbly things like soda, of course, but carbonation is a, a killer on osteoporosis. Anything that is carbonated with phosphoric acid. Phosphorus is going to kind of leach the calcium out, so you want nothing with phosphoric acid, which really is dark sodas. 
Um, most even light ones, and not on, I'm, I'm a bubbly water gal. I'm a no soda, no diet, water. no regular sodas <laughs> from my standpoint. Okay, yeah, the bubbly water is fine because okay. it's phosphoric acid, and if you're concerned, just look at that label. Not a lot of it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Chinese medicine. It can it can wane digestion over time. Oh really? I take I I love it because then it I don't want soda. I just love the bubbles and. Yeah. There's always a continuum, way better yep. than soda. So. Yep. <laughs> yep. Tea, I'm a herbal tea gal yeah. to get my water in and, and lemon with water. Yeah. I have a question. This is really great and it's a lot to think about and I'm definitely processing it. I, I have a question about food intolerances and how that is affected with this statement, really. Well, my feeling on our food intolerances and our food allergies is our messed up food system. Um, wheat is not genetically modified, but it has been hybridized in much the similar processes. We hybridize wheat with bacteria and viruses. We have literally changed wheat. It used to be the amber waves of grain. Now it's about this high. And it's got a protein in it that we are reacting horribly to. And the wheat sensitivities are scary because it can be something like dyskinesia, where you're moving and you can't control it. It's so widespread in what the wheat does mm -hmm. that it's, it's a little scary. But certain genotypes are more sensitive to things like celiac. Um, uh, you see that in the Jewish population. So yeah, certain, so certain genotypes are, but... Um, they lead, I guess what I'm wondering is if we have intolerances, is that leading us to disease if we're constantly inflamed from things that we're eating? Oh, absolutely. We're kind of habituated to it. Absolutely. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. absolutely. Headache, going, you know, it's just like a stressful day or whatever. Because we don't <laughs> really have tests to say unless we get rid of things, right? Well, yeah, yeah. we do. The, the, the gold standard for determining those is the elimination and challenge diet. And you need, so for any of you guys who have thought about this, you need at least 21 days to clear the IgG immunoglobulins that are uh, causing a lot of these food sensitivities. Um, and so a minimum of 21 days to clear those out and then you start introducing foods back in. That's something I do.